Hey guys, this is John, and this is an analysis of my second round game from the 2016 Twin Ports Open. And if you recall, I won in the first round on the black side of a Scandinavian against roughly a 2,000 rated player. Go Team Scandi, right? So I was sitting on 1-0, as were many other players. And just to refresh your memory about the field, so there were two Grandmasters in the field. Grandmaster Alex Yermolinsky was the top seed, and Grandmaster Brian Smith, the defending champion for this tournament, was the third rated seed. And I was sandwiched right in between those guys based on USCF ratings, which you see listed here on the right-hand side. And there were many other Masters in the, in the field, too. So, strong tournament. And in this second round, I'm playing Tim Rodermacher, who is rated 2196 USCF, so a little under USCF Master. But this guy was a strong player, uh, especially back in the 80s and 90s. I was talking to someone at the tournament, and he said that Tim used to be rated around 2450 USCF. So definitely a dangerous opponent, someone you don't want to take lightly. And I decided to open with knight f3. I feel most comfortable with this move these days. I'm also playing d4 a lot, but knight f3 is kind of my go-to. So Tim responded with d5. I played g3. Quite often I'll also play d4 if I want to guide the game back into symmetric d4, d5 waters. But I played g3 in this case. Knight f6, bishop g2, e6. So this locks in black's light square bishop, but this does allow him to begin thinking about how to develop the dark square bishop, which will usually land on e7. And transpositions to a Catalan opening are abundant from here. We could easily wind up in a Catalan from this position. So I just played flexible, I castle. Notice how I haven't touched any of my center pawns yet. I'm just waiting to see how black builds their setup. Tim plays c5, and I play c4 in reply. So this gives black an option. They can leave the pawn tension as is. They can take me on c4. They could even think about pushing past with d4. I didn't think d4 was very likely because this leads to a reversed Benoni position. And I think a lot of players would not like to play this as black simply because black has already committed to e6. If white plays something like e3 and black plays knight c6 and we get a trade here, it is a bit of a hindrance that black has played e6 rather than establishing the pawn on e5 straight away where it can support this. And I think this is still playable for black, but I would not have minded at all to go into this. So after c4, Tim just maintained the tension. He played knight c6. Had he taken on c4, I can regain the pawn immediately if I like with queen a4 check. I can play knight a3 maybe and go after the pawn this way with knight takes c4. So white will regain the pawn. So knight c6. I took on d5, he recaptured with the pawn, and now I played d4. And by transposition, we have got into a Terash defense. So those of you who are familiar with that opening from the black side, uh, you'll recognize this transposition. And in the Terash, black often ends up with an isolated d-pawn, because white's d-pawn and black's c-pawn are very likely to be traded, and black will be left with this lone pawn in the center, which can be either a weakness or a strength. It very much depends. Black has a more prominent pawn, like black's d5 pawn will definitely make a greater impression than white's e2 pawn, but it comes at a price, and that price is that it has to be defended by black's pieces. So one of the advantages of playing knight f3 on move one is that you often catch people sort of unawares. I feel like a lot of people are uncomfortable with the flexible nature of knight f3. And I noticed this when I was a Benko Gambit player from the black side. And you can play the Benko Gambit quite comfortably, against d4, of course. But against knight f3 on move one, you can't really get into that particular opening. And I noticed that strong players, after they know uh, they had known that I played the Benko Gambit, they began opening with knight f3 with greater frequency. And I distinctly remember many games where I was getting move order. So um, that's one benefit of knight f3 is that you can catch people outside of their preparation. And I think that's what happened to Tim here. I don't think he's a regular Tarash player based on his next move, which is not the main line. So he played bishop f5. And Terash players will tell you that black usually plays bishop e7, and then after knight c3 and castles, we're in one of the main line positions. Uh, white has a number of options here. d takes c5, bishop g5 is the main move. And there's tons and tons of theory from this position. So bishop f5, on the other hand, I was happy to see that because I felt like black may experience problems. Um, particularly with the defense of the d5 pawn. So I was looking forward to attacking that. 
Also, if you're a d4 player, you might have trained yourself after bishop f5 to look at queen b3, which hits both the d5 pawn and the pawn on b7, which is newly undefended because black has committed their bishop. Here, I do not think queen b3 is that good because there is no uh, immediate attack on d5 that black will have to think too hard about. It's mainly the attack on the b7 pawn. So they could play something like knight a5 and attack my queen and defend b7. And if I deliver a check here, probably just bishop d7, and I'm losing time with my queen. So queen b3 crossed my mind, but I would like it more if d5 was undefended or weakly defended. So then I could get the double attack. So after bishop f5, I just played knight c3. Tim played bishop e7. I went bishop g5. And here he castled. So here's where the deficiency of bishop f5 begins to show. I captured on c5. Now, if he recaptures, so bishop takes c5, I can win a pawn by playing bishop takes f6, removing one of the, def the defenders, queen takes f6, and now queen takes d5. Important to take with the queen, because if we were to take with the knight instead, then black does have queen takes b2, regaining the pawn. So queen takes d5, on the other hand, should just win a clean pawn. I thought that after bishop b6, this wouldn't be a walk in the park or anything for white. Black does have the bishop pair and an otherwise fine position, but hey, a pawn is a pawn. I wouldn't have minded trying to grind out something from this position. So black could consider this. It might actually be one of the best options at this stage. But after d takes c5, Tim decided to play d4, advancing and attacking my knight. Here I inserted the capture, bishop takes f6. This was just to deflect black's bishop away from guarding or attacking the c5 pawn. And he did take with the bishop. He doesn't want to damage his structure, so this makes sense. And now knight b5. Now I was feeling very confident here because I'm up a pawn. The onus is on black to either regain the pawn or prove some compensation. And my knight has this nice landing square on d6, supported by the c5 pawn. So Tim thought for a little while here, and he came up with a good move which, to his credit, is um, not always easy to do after you've made a mistake, especially this early in the game. Buckling down and finding a good way to continue with the game versus lashing out and doing something drastic and potentially making your position worse uh, is something that a good player will do. They'll, they'll sit there and think it out and try to make the best of a bad situation. And he did that with his next move. One line I was calculating here was if black played d3, to me, this seemed like the most principled move. Trying to open the position for the bishop pair, which black does now possess, and the bishop is attacking b2. However, the line I calculated from here is that I can jump into d6 anyways with tempo on the bishop, and if black were to take on e2, that works fine for me because I get to connect my rooks, and the queen now defends the pawn on b2. I should remain up a solid pawn, maybe with the rook coming to d1 soon. So I thought after d3, knight d6, the critical line would be bishop takes b2, giving the bishop on, on f5, but after bishop takes a1, queen takes a1, d takes e2, trying to prove that uh, black fighting with the rook against two minor pieces, but with the annoying pawn on e2, gives him some compensation. However, it took me a couple minutes to realize that in this position, white just has queen takes g7 checkmate, <laughs> which really puts a damper on things from black's point of view, to say the least. So once I saw that little detail, queen takes g7 checkmate, as opposed to playing like, I don't know, I was looking at like rook e1, and then what happens if black plays queen d5, um, that really convinced me that this must be the correct line of play for me. And this was all stuff I thought about when I played knight to b5, by the way. So trying to figure out what happens if d3. So Tim played queen d7 instead. And this is a good move. It reinforces the bishop on f5, but most importantly defends the pawn on b7 and connects the rooks. He's just trying to coordinate his forces now. He's not going to win the pawn back in the short term, but at least he's managing. So I jumped in, knight d6, hitting his bishop, and he retreated bishop to g6. And yes, my knight is pretty dominant on this square. It makes a nice impression. But I do have to remember that black possesses the bishop pair. And if the position opens up in the long term, it may not be easy to neutralize that. So here I played rook c1. I figured that the pawn on c5 was undefended, and that was supporting my knight. So we might as well bring a piece into the action and defend that guy. 
And here Tim played rook ab8, which was interesting, like further supporting the b pawn and potentially thinking about playing b6, a gradual undermining of the c5 pawn and the knight on d6. He also vacates this long diagonal, so his rook is not staring down the barrel of my bishop on g2. And here I played queen d2, so connecting my rooks. I thought about a few different moves at this stage. Queen a4 is one move I recall thinking about in some detail, but ultimately I decided that connecting the rooks while still maintaining an attack on d4 was probably best. So here Tim did decide to play b6, attacking the pawn on c5, and I support it with b4. He takes, and I take back with my pawn. Okay, so key moment of the game right here. I've succeeded in maintaining my one pawn advantage. However, the position is kind of an interesting standoff at the moment. I didn't think it was going to be easy from here, especially if black decides to just sit there and maybe make some small improving moves if possible. Because notice that bishop on g6, that controls the b1 square, so it makes it very difficult for me to ever contest this b file. I just can't get rook b1 in easily. And also the bishop on f6 is doing some good work defending the pawn on d4, and maybe he can toy with the idea of playing d3 and sneaking a rook into b2 supported by that bishop on f6. So I was thinking about how I would try to break down black's position here if he played something like h6, and I gotta say, it would have been difficult. I mean, I have an advantage, but if I turn on the local analysis right now, I know you guys can't see this, I decided to hide the local analysis. So Stockfish gives roughly a 1.2, 1.4 advantage to white, but it's kind of of a static nature. Like the moves it's suggesting are like, again, small improving moves. Rook FD1 for white, wants to go knight E1 potentially, opening the bishop on G2, maybe trying to maneuver the knight to D3. I thought if I could win one of black's bishops, that would be awesome, but H6 always ensures that, let's say I get a knight to F4, black can just drop back to H7. So I'd have to massage the position from here. Fortunately for me, Tim made a big mistake with his next move. And I thought he might try this move, so I had the refutation in mind even before he played it. But let's see what that move was. So it was rook b4. Now, if you'd like to pause your video and figure out how white can take advantage of this move, feel free to do so now. Okay, so the refutation of rook b4 is the aesthetically pleasing knight e5, jumping into the center. Not often you can play a knight move into the middle of the board where the square you're occupying is guarded by two of your enemy pieces. So the bishop and the knight are both attacking e5, what gives, right? But then you start to look at black's coordination and you realize how fragile it is. If knight takes e5, then the rook on b4 has no defenders. So I just scoop that up, queen takes b4. And if bishop takes e5, as played in the game, I can remove the defender with bishop takes c6, giving up my fianchettoed bishop, but after queen takes c6, forced, queen takes b4, again, I've won the exchange. I've won a rook for a minor piece. So this is a very nice move to play, um, and black is in big trouble after this. And they're already down a pawn, but now they're going to be down even more material. So rook b4, the, the real deficiency of that is just the, the small thread that black's position is hanging under. I and mean, if you're to play that move, you got to make sure your knight on c6 is rock solid because he probably looked at slower ways for me to remove the defender, uh, maybe like knight h4 or knight e1, whereupon he does have time to play his other rook over to b8. And then I might even have some, some stuff to think about with black gearing up for rook b2. But he overlooked the immediate knight e5, the strength of this. And by the way, knight takes d4 does not work as well. It doesn't work, period, because of rook takes d4. And he gets his rook onto a more defended square. After bishop takes c6, queen takes c6, I can't play queen takes d4. It's held by the bishop. So knight e5, bishop takes e5, bishop takes c6. There's nowhere for the attacked black queen to go that will also support the rook on b4. So he does have to take. Queen takes. And now I knew my advantage was decisive. We're now in the conversion stage. And when you're converting 
a winning position, one thing you want to keep in mind, like probably the major thing, is cutting down your opponent's counterplay. Once you've reached a point in the chess game where you have enough material, where you know it's in the bag, all you have to do really is ensure that your opponent doesn't whip up enough play to make your life miserable. And I knew here with black having the queen plus the bishop pair, I would have to take some care. And in particular, if I could trade queens, that would probably guarantee victory. A queen trade is usually a signal in a position that uh, the king's safety for both sides is going to be secure. So if I was able to trade queens, I had a feeling I was going to win this game no problem. So therefore, after queen to d7, trying to reposition his queen, maybe scare me with queen into h3, I played queen b7, hounding his queen, offering a trade. Tim did play the queen into h3. But here I can play a nice centralizing move. Black doesn't have any immediate threats, so there are a number of tries white has here. Note that I can't push the c-pawn the right away because I would drop the knight on d6. But I played queen d5, centralizing and attacking the bishop. I really liked this move. And if black plays the bishop away somewhere, like say bishop f6, then I am clear to push the c-pawn. Black just doesn't have enough going towards my king. It would be a dream scenario for black to get in bishop e4 to try to coordinate for queen g2, but that's just not going to happen. I've got that square defended twice. So once I played queen d5, I felt like this was essentially over. Black was either going to have to take my knight, whereupon I get to take with the pawn, get the pawn one square closer to queening. He still has trouble including his bishop in the attack. There's just not enough going against my king for black to uh, save this game. And after queen to d5, he played the queen back to e6, offering a trade. Definitely not a move black would like to play, but he didn't have too many other options. So I swapped queens and then played rook fd1, just a calm move. I felt like this was helpful, including my last piece, and also attacking the pawn on d4. Now I have ideas of knight b5, which would hit both a7 and d4. Again, I can't move my c-pawn yet because I would drop the knight on d6. So rook fd1. Black played rook to d8. And here I had a little bit of a think, because I felt like the position was ripe to win immediately. But I had to calculate a few things to confirm that evaluation. So white to move. If you want to find the most efficient way for white to win, feel free to pause your video and do that. Okay, so black is threatening to take on d6 and try to regain one point of material and defend d4. May not be completely simple after that. So the move I really wanted to play, and I eventually did calculate out to work, was c6. Abandoning the knight on d6, but focusing on the strength of our pass pawn. And now all the lines work for white, fortunately. So if black takes with the rook on d6, c7, this pawn is a runaway train. It's just queening. That's easy to see. And if bishop takes d6, as he played, I have this nice in-between move. So before I play c7... I play rook takes d4, pinning black along the d-file. And now our main threat is rook takes d6, rook takes d6, c7. And again, black will be unable to stop the pawn. And quite simply, black just has no good defense here that uh, avoids losing material. If he plays the bishop away somewhere, so let's say bishop c7, well, I can trade the rooks and then play c7. Black will have to give up their bishop. And in this resulting position, I'm up in exchange plus a pawn in a very reduced material situation. Easy win for white. If he plays, let's say, a king move. I think I was looking at king f8. Yeah, here I can play rook takes d6 again, as I already described. Note that I would not want to play c7, because c7 does allow bishop takes c7, and black is attacking the rook on d4, so I don't have time for rook takes. And after take and take, I can't play rook c8 because of king e7. And again, black is escaping, surviving, and thriving. But fortunately, that rook takes d6 operation is always on. So after rook takes d4, he tried bishop f5. The idea there is that if I play that rook takes d6 move now, 
and then c7 he can play e5 and the bishop is controlling c8 i could queen but after bishop takes rook takes we are in an end game where maybe black has some hope probably this is still technically winning for white even after that and go scoop up that pawn i'm up two pawns in a rook end game but i wouldn't want to allow this to happen so after bishop f5 i played c7 instead and again all this had to be calculated before i play c6 i want to stress that if you're going to play a a move as committal as c6 giving up an entire knight and placing your position on the shoulders of the c-pawn you better be sure that it's working out in all lines and that you're winning in all lines otherwise why take the risk i could just play something simpler here and get the job done so after bishop f5 i played c7 and even though he can reply with bishop takes c7 the point is that after rook takes d8 bishop takes d8 in this case, rook c8 is good because his king is still standing on g8, as opposed to that other line where his king was already on f8 and he could play king e7 to defend. But not here. He is pinned along the 8th rank, and he will just lose this bishop entirely. So Tim played e5, attacking my rook. I just took the bishop check. King f7, rook a8, and now black resigned. Already down what three points of material and he's losing another pawn on a7 so this will be a straightforward conversion for white so a 31 move victory and what can we say about this game what lessons can we extract well i was talking about the value of opening with knight f3 i think this is a move that is better suited for higher rated players so those of you who are let's say sub 1600 maybe even sub 1800 I don't think I would recommend knight f3 as your primary move as white. Knight f3 comes to the fore more so when you gain some d4 experience. So if you're a d4 player as white and you dislike facing certain openings, such as the Nimzo Indian, for instance. This is a very annoying line. I, as a d4 player as well, always have trouble against the Nimzo Indian because it's such a high quality defense for black. Well, you can sometimes open with knight f3 or even c4 on move one is a, a transpositional move you can toy with. With the idea of trying to cross people who have major defenses like that that work well against d4 but don't do so well against transpositions. You know, I mentioned the Banco Gambit. It's virtually impossible for black to get to a Banco Gambit against knight f3 if white is intent on preventing that. Also a Grunfeld defense. If black is a Grunfeld player, which is this line, this is pretty specific to d4 openings. And it's a very good d4 defense, one of the highest scoring. And a lot of players, when they know they're going to face a Grunfeld defense, they will open with knight f3 to try to avoid it. And after knight f6, you can play like g3, or you can play c4. And if black is intent on playing a Grunfeld-type setup going for this, white has some extra options because they haven't committed the d-pawn. That's the big thing. You're keeping the d-pawn back on d2. You might bring it to d4, but you also might try to derive some benefit from uh, it sitting on d2. So again, I wouldn't recommend knight f3 just out of the blue to lower rated players who are watching this video, but if you're like a seasoned d4 player, you've been around the block a time or two, you might consider including this move in your repertoire because I tell you, a lot of people just don't put in study against knight f3, whereas they study a lot of lines against e4 and d4, and you can just cross them. You can cross their preparation by opening with this move. And I think that's kind of what happened here. I think I caught Tim in a line that he doesn't have so much experience with because... Again, like the Tarash main line is bishop e7 followed by castling. Bishop f5 is a dubious attempt, I think. And I was able to win a pawn after that. Tim did find some good moves here, like I was praising queen d7. I think that was computer approved. Also, this idea of playing rook b8 and pawn to b6 is not too bad. I think black is gaining some counterplay that way as well, trying to open the b file. He just made a mistake, a big mistake right here with that rook b4 move. A move that would work if the knight was solid on c6, but we have that nice way to exploit it with knight e5. Had black played, you know, h6 or rook f d8, it would have been a tougher grind. I would have had to maneuver and gradually improve my pieces. So, again, if this, I was looking at lines like rook f d1, maybe with knight e1 to come. I think this maneuver is pretty good for white. Knight d3 to f4, attacking the bishop. Maybe someday I can get in knight d5. So I moved to 2-0 after this game, and I hope very soon to be able to analyze 
my round three game where I was paired with women's grandmaster Camila Bagenskeit, who is a strong player. She's played in many U.S. women's championships. I think she's won it a time or two. And she is also the wife of Grandmaster Alex Yermolinsky. So look forward to that video coming up. All right, guys, thanks for watching. Let me know if you have any questions, and I'll be back again soon. Bye.